These are the meats, uh, beef, chicken, fish. Uh, avoid bottom feeders because those are the ones that eat the small fish and then they accumulate more heavy metals. Lamb, turkey are also good options. Um, what are feeders? Catfish, tilapia, salmon. Are, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> Salmon's not too bad. It's just got to depend on your source of salmon. Again, you just don't want to eat salmon eight times a week. That's the big thing is just if you're going to eat, look, I like tuna. I like swordfish. I just don't eat that as my only f fish intake. Like I like cod, halibut, um, you know, mackerel is supposed to be pretty bad. Uh, what's the other one? Not mackerel. No, I don't like sardines. I can't do those for some reason. Um, but so what are the best fish? Just variety. Like, again, I like mahi-mahi. It's not a huge fish. Just wild you want to think smaller. Fish. Yeah. Yeah. If you, uh, is it Michael Pollan? Michael Pollan writes about, you know, what we're eating. He gives you some good insight about, like, the farm-raised fish. Yeah. Don't touch that stuff. <laughs> Literally, like, it, they so talk to um, Is it Michael Pollan? Michael Pollan? Pollan or Palin? I'll, I can pull it up here and verify. Actually, can somebody with the iPhone, Al, can you verify that? Because I don't think the Internet is working on this computer right yeah, now. farm-raised fish very tiny. Yeah, they they Somebody talk. Tell me they grow them in the sewer tanks. No, they'll they'll, they'll keep them. <laughs> no, they'll, they might as well. They'll grow they them might. in like netted like communities off the coast. They'll grow them like netted communities off the coast, and like what their waste is doing to the fish that are healthy. They're like they're like killing off other healthy non-farm raised populations of fish from the pellets and the food they're consuming. Uh, low glycemic fruits: apples, apricots, avocados, berries, cherries. Gives you some example. If you have, uh, if you're on blood thinners, avoid group, grapefruit. That's not in order. Though. No, it's not in order. I just, I just. What are high glycemic fruits? <laughs> oranges or low glycemic? Uh, they're better options. Again, I wouldn't go eat a full orange. Our body is very efficient at using the energy. It's more fructose sugar. And it's not high fructose corn syrup. That's a completely different animal. That's converted easily into fat and makes us even more diabetic. So, um, so in, by contrast, what is a high glycemic fruit? Um, bananas. And bananas watermelon. for sure. Watermelon. watermelon. Um, yeah, watermelon's really bad. Pineapple. I, I don't mind pineapple. Pineapple's got bromelain, which is really good for our GI tract. It just don't go binging out on it and that's the thing is again in moderation most fruits are going to be okay it's just when you're like somebody that eats something and you feel like all lightheaded after that's when you have to be really really careful of this i've had people that come in and like hey look if i don't eat for an hour i literally might pass out in the bathtub and it's just like this is when you take a full-fledged swinging approach at hey we gotta stop this and turn this around because it's really threatening to your health because you're going to fall down, you drive, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but. I just, I just wonder if there's oranges and yeah. plums, or oranges and grapes. Yeah, grapes, cherries I heard aren't, they're okay too, depending. Oh. Most berries are. Yeah, most berries are not too bad. Um, foods include, again, coconut oil. Uh, anything from a coconut's great for us. Good fiber, good fat. Yeah, medium chain fatty acids. Seventy percent of our fuel source that keeps our GI tract healthy comes from medium chain fatty acids and short chain fatty acids. So, medium chain fatty acids are beautiful for our brain. They help our brains stay nice and healthy. Different herbs and spices: apple cider vinegar, herbal teas, olive oil, olives. Don't use olive oil to cook with. Coconut oil or something that's more heat tolerant. It becomes, now after like low to medium heat, it becomes carcinogenic and it's denatures and becomes worse. Mm -hmm. On salad? Um, I know four oils that Palm oil. Well, no, four oils that don't um, oxidize at mm -hmm. high temperature, like the coconut oil, safflower oil, mm -hmm. sunflower oil, and clarified butter. Not yeah. butter, but clarified. Like ghee? Is it ghee? ghee? Yeah. Uh -huh. Ghee, I don't mind. It's a bit better ghee than. Is great. Yeah. What about sesame oil? Sesame oil is better for salad. So, yeah, high heat tolerant on sesame oil isn't the best. It burns really quick. If you cook with it, it like 
you have like two seconds until it smells like it's burning. Uh, avoid. So these are things if you're finding like you if you think you have a lot of reactivity, this is why I caution you to go right back to allowing. I say if you really want to do this 100%. Avoid this slide for three to four weeks and then start to add it back in one at a time. Why not three minutes? Just because they're a very they're common allergen. Okay. So that's just the main thing. Not the aflatoxin? Well, that too, but it's more so just their common allergen. Okay. Aflatoxin could provoke our immune system. It's, beans, it's the same thing. I don't mind you eating these things. It's just for the first month, we're just trying to remove all the, the big ones. You can add tomatoes on this list, green peppers, eggplant as well. It's just this is just the random ones that I was reading through and decided to add in at the end to not have, but then to add back in. Most grains though, this is where oatmeal comes in. Oatmeal, I don't mind it. It's a better source of fuel, but again, majority of them has gluten in it, which I'd hazard you just to stay away from that stuff for the rest of your life. Um, and a lot of times, even if it comes in like a gluten-free package, what they'll do is when they crop it, it'll be in a gluten-free facility but when they take it out of that company where it's certified gluten-free and they go to like the smaller packaging plants like mm -hmm. Red Mill or whatever it is, Bob's, like there's they have gluten containing products and those faculty facilities aren't always strictly run. So that's yeah, what happens to potatoes <laughs> uh, sweet potatoes I don't mind. Uh, normal potatoes I'd caution just again starchy, sugary and it's just, we're trying to, yeah, try to stay away from that. Again. Except for French fries that have to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about, um, like in a sweet potato? That's what Can I said. you put butter in it? What, uh, butter in if it? you want to put, I put cinnamon in it. Uh -huh. Cinnamon's really good at keeping our blood sugar levels neutralized. And I put, yeah, ghee or, you know, like. A, a, Even coconut milk. Coconut milk. I put coconut milk. Great. Yeah, when I make Thanksgiving, I just use sweet potatoes with coconut milk and cinnamon. Brown sugar. Nutmeg. Brown sugar? Yeah. Yeah, you can use a whole bunch of, like, a lot of that stuff's better. I got, like, again, brown sugar, I'll use the more raw or natural sugars, I'll use it. But again, I don't, like, it's, again, that's like the one day out of, what, like, Thanksgiving, Christmas, I'll do it. But even that, I'm not going like heavy. It's just when you start to develop a taste for sugar, your brain starts to crave this stuff. And that's why it's just when I say, hey, don't eat gluten, dairy, usually most people are like, Whoa, and you know, have some type of aversion to it because we get addicted to this stuff. Where's my martini? Yeah. <laughs> not in it for a while. <laughs> for the first little bit, not in it if we want to get, you know. Again, this is 90% of the time. When you're healthy and you're going strong, and you don't have all the, you know, any of these symptoms or a collection of them, if you do this 90% of the time, you'll be feeling pretty good. If you have some of these symptoms or the first three or four slides, then you want to start getting this stuff going for a month, month and a half, see how you start to feel. And that's when I say try adding stuff back in, and, but note how you feel. You may take a sip of alcohol and be like, I cannot do that. And you just, okay, let's try this type of alcohol. Let's try wine. Oh, hey, I handle red wine better. And that's just... It's a learning process of what your body's going to tolerate. Uh, these are things that help our adrenal glands function. Vitamin C, very, very, very essential in the production of adrenal hormones. As well, it helps act as an antioxidant to the adrenal cortex itself. Uh, this just kind of goes through ratios. Um, basically, if you're taking vitamin C and you're starting to have loose and runny stool, you've kind of reached your, your peak of how much you're having. You want to taper back until it firms up. Uh, vitamin E, not directly involved, but it's in, directly involved with the process of making your adrenal hormones. Again, you don't want to overdo it with that. I've listed how much to add on to it. Uh, about 800 I use of the mixed forms of vitamin E uh, are going to be better. And it's mainly this is the one what you have. You want to have some beta to tocopherols just because those are really important in terms of adrenal function and helping out. You can have the other ones too, but that's the main one with that. That's why those two products I have, have all this stuff already in a lot of it. B vitamins, I'm gonna tell you, if you're not taking B vitamins, you should be. B vitamins are involved in pretty much every process in our body. 
energy production, maturing red blood cells, again, adrenal gland function, taking care of excess inflammation. By, you know, it, they're involved with everything. Liver detoxification, producing neurotransmitters, B vitamins are always involved. So. Uh, minerals and trace minerals, magnesium, calcium, citrate, uh, zinc, manganese, selenium, molybdenum, chromium, copper, and iodine are all very, very, very important in terms of proper adrenal function. The only thing is if you have Hashimoto's or <coughs> autoimmune uh, thyroid, try to stay away from iodine as much as possible. Is all thyroid autoimmune? In the U.S., 90% is low functioning thyroid. 90% in the U.S. is autoimmune. 90% worldwide is just iodine deficiency. But in the U.S. it's not iodine, it's more autoimmune. Autoimmune brought about by this stress? Some of it, stress, stress, gut breakdown, you know, limes. You, there's so many different things that play into it. It's just stress to the immune system. Eventually the immune system's gotta give. We start attacking our own tissue because you just lose sensitivity of what's our tissue versus what's not. And then that goes on for a while, and then the immune system kicks out, and then you see cancer get kicked on because we don't catch something. Uh, these are all herbs that are very, very, very uh, helpful for supplementing our adrenal glands. Licorice root is a good one. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory, has anti-stress properties, and it helps stabilize blood sugar by keeping our blood sugar levels up. A lot of our supplements, like uh, the, this brand of supplement, Apex is very, very specific towards autoimmune, chronic stress patients. That's why we carry uh, the only one that doesn't have licorice root. This I don't think does. Our stress there's a cream that we have for the stress glands, uh, for like if you depending on what part of the spectrum you are, and if you're still in stress mode or if you're to the point where it's exhausted, they all have licorice root in it. So it's just again, I'm just giving you very, very general uh, like. I'm, don't want to just usually if I may recommend a supplement, I want to talk to you about it and just not you know throw stuff at you. Ashwagandha root, again, it's an Indian herb. It's been used back to 1000 BC in terms of remedies for a whole various uh, host of conditions. But again, it's an adaptogen. An adaptogen is any substance that helps your body maintain homeostasis and basically neutral function. Uh, ginseng root, Siberian ginseng root, again, adaptogens ginger root, ginkgo leaf, all these things here help support blood sugar and even more importantly, adrenal function. Just think if you just grate ginger into whatever you're cooking. Yeah. You're yeah. Your smoothie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. smoothie. Ginger you can buy easily. The other yeah. ones are a bit more difficult. But if you start adding this stuff in, it's that's why I'm kind of going over that. Like you make a stir fry with good vegetables, good meat, good fat, and you add ginger to it, you start to have it. So time for change. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Question. Ginkgo and uh, ginseng. Mm -hmm. Seems like I read that for my particular situation, it's not good. Depends on what. Uh, depends on what part and then what type of ginseng. There's different. There's red ginseng and there's another one. Some of these can be very, very stimulating. Mm -hmm. uh, ginkgo. Uh, do you mind sharing what you? MS. Yeah, so you gotta understand when you, like stress is one of the worst things for an autoimmune patient because it literally, you go heavy Th1 pathway, which again, if you're, that's where your immune system's already polarized or more efficient in, that you will usually start the cascade going towards an autoimmune flare up. Now, some of these, again, for the average person, not an issue. That's again why these, this company, they work with the autoimmune neurological realm. All their products are, and autoimmune neutral, so they're not giving you anything specific. They have two products. Um, one is x and the other one's uh, XFLM. They're really, they're the only two products that they have that are actually meant to stimulate your immune system in one way or the other. So I wouldn't give you the one that's gonna stimulate one immune pathway, but I may give you the other one that tries to create neutrality and then a lot of vitamin D kind of bring you up. Uh, so this is the thing is if you know anybody with any of those four sheets of questions, 
it's important that you get talking to them and educate them. That's our goal here is to educate everybody in the office because really it's just people don't have to be sick. People don't have to be tired. People don't have to be just high blood pressure, cardiovascular accidents, cholesterol issues because really these are all things that, you know, for the most part, we don't have to face. We should have long, healthy lives. And that's my biggest thing is just getting people living healthy, good energy and understanding that everybody can have it. It's just a matter of it does take drastic change, especially if you've kind of got comfortable or been down, a, you know, efficient at the opposite end of the spectrum. It takes drastic change. But the cool thing is, is our bodies are always changing. Our cells are always turning over. And the cool thing is, is there's something called epigenetics, which is the environment acting on our genes. So we can literally start to switch the genes on to a more favorable position. And that's why I'm talking to you about this stuff tonight because it's not a death sentence. It's not something you have to just always be victim to. It just it takes an effort, but it's you'll be healthier and happier in the long run. So. Is there, a, and this is not a joke. It's a serious question. Is there a, an age point at which it really doesn't? Your body's always really changing. Again, like, that's the beautiful thing is, we have a what, stroke patient that's 78 years old, four years post stroke. He was. That he went to all the best areas in the country to, or in Dallas that, oh, you're going to be able to walk again. Came into our office four years later, tried all those things and failed. His brain is taking the input we've given it in two months where he's lifting his leg up completely. And that's a 78-year-old brain. Brain tissue doesn't turn over like the rest of our body tissue. If his brain tissue is able to turn over at 78 and become more efficient, I assure you the rest of your body tissue can. Like our, our gut tissue has a four-day lifespan. Our liver tissue, spleen, or sorry, liver, red blood cells, 120 days. I mean, these things are constantly turning over. So you, you can change the tide. It's just a matter of you got to change the environment before you can expect to see a change in, you know, the biochemistry and the physiology of your body.